Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to chapter 35 of House of the Scorpion, El Dio de los Muertos. There are actually three more chapters beyond this, because it goes to 38, not 35, but I'd, like I'd previously thought. But we'll continue on anyway. <clears throat> the walk downhill was easy, but Matt found he had to stop and rest frequently. He ached all over from his ordeal the night before, and some of his scratches were infected. He looked back to see Tauntaun watching gravely from the shadows at the top of the pass. The snout of the shrimp harvester was just visible. Fidelidio bounced up and down, waving the flashlight. Do you think he can see me? I'm sure he can, said Matt. Sometimes Fidelidio's energy made him feel tired. They went on, which Fidelidio, with Fidelidio asking questions about who they were going to see. Matt told him about the Maria and the convent of Santa Clara. He didn't know what the convent looked like, but he made up a description to entertain the little boy. It's a castle on a hill, he said. It has a tower with a red roof on each corner. Every morning, the girls raise the flag in the garden. Like the keepers, said Philodidio. Yes, said Matt. Every morning, the keepers lined up the boys and raised a flag with the emblem of a beehive over the factory. The boys recited the five principles of good citizenship and the four attitudes leading to right mindfulness before trooping into the cafeteria for plankton gruel. This flag has a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The girls sing Buenos Dias, Paloma Blanca, her favorite song, and then they have toast and, they have toast and honey for breakfast. Fidelidio sighed. Matt wondered whether the keepers had managed to wake up from their drugged sleep. Were they all lying dead like poor Furball? And would Tauntaun be arrested for murder? Can the keepers get water in their compound? He asked. Flacco said they could drink out of the toilet, said Fidelidio. It's hard, but it's fair, Matt thought with a grim smile. <laughs> That smell is making me sick, said Fidelidio. Matt lifted his head. The stench had been growing so gradually he hadn't registered it. We must be close to the river, he said. He scratched the skin of a lemon and held it to Fidelidio's nose. This won't kill the smell, but it should keep you from throwing up. Matt heard a gurgling thrashing noise uh, somewhere to the left and shone the flashlight on it. A wide black ribbon of water disappeared into a giant drain. It glistened with oil, and here their shape struggled to the surface were pulled down again. Is that a fish? whispered Philodidio. I don't think so, Matt said, shining the light on a long, greasy-looking tentacle whipped out of the flood and struggled wildly against the shore. I think that's the reason Tom told, told, you, to, told you to stay away from the river. The tentacle lost the battle and disappeared down the drain with a horrible sucking sound. Let's run, begged the little boy. The ground rumbled as the vast river plunged underneath the road. The smell almost made Matt faint. Bad air, bad air, he thought wildly. If they passed out here, no one would rescue them. Faster, Matt gasped, but in fact, he was the one who was slow. Philodidio bounded ahead like a monkey. They went up a rise. A slight breeze blew the nauseous stench of the river away, and Matt collapsed with his chest heaving. He began to cough. He felt like he was being strangled. Oh no, he thought. I can't have an asthma attack now. He had been free of the illness since he left opium, but the smell of the bad river had brought it back. He bent over, trying to fill his lungs. Philodidio frankly scratched his lemon and held it to, his, to Matt's nose. Smell, smell, he cried, but it didn't help. Matt was drenched in sweat from his efforts to get air. I'll go for help, shouted Philodidio into his ears, though Matt were deaf as well. Stop, it's dangerous, Matt wanted to say, but he was just as well. But maybe it was just as well the little boy went on. There was nothing Matt could do to protect him. How much time passed, Matt couldn't say. The world had shrunk into a tiny patch of road where he struggled to stay alive. But all at once, his he, he felt hands and lift him an inhaler. An inhaler. Held to, held to his face. Matt grabbed it and breathed for all he was worth. The attack faded. The world began to expand again. He saw a brown, weathered face etched by deep wrinkles. Look at what the river coughed up, Guapo, said the woman. Guapo, a name meaning handsome. Hunked by the side of the road and gave Matt a big, almost toothless grin. He was at least 80 years old. The kid picked a lousy place to swim, he said. I was joking, said the woman. Nobody swims in that river and survives. Can you walk? asked Matt. Matt got to his feet. He took a few unsteady steps and nodded. Stay with us, the woman said. I don't suppose your mother's expecting you home tonight. He's a runaway orphan. Look at his uniform, said Guapo. You call those rags a uniform? The woman laughed. 
Don't worry, Nino. We won't tell anyone. We hate the Keepers as much as you do. Chacho. Matt gasped out. The little one told us about him, said Guapo. Look, the ambulance is already on its way. He pointed up, and Matt saw a hovercraft passed overhead. The anti-gravity stirred the air, hair on his arms. With Guapo on one side of the woman, who identified herself as Sister Consuela, on the other, Matt made his way along the road. He felt lightheaded. Everything seemed unreal. The dark road, the starry sky, the old man and woman who guided his steps. Presently, they came to a high wall. Consuelo passed and pressed a button, and a door slid open away to show a scene and so unexpected. Matt wondered whether he had been dreaming after all. Inside, flanked by graceful Palo Verde trees, were graves as far as Matt could see. Each one was decorated with palm fronds, flowers, photographs, statues, and hundreds of glistening candles. The candles sat in red, blue, green, yellow, and purple glasses and looked like fragments of rainbow dancing over the ground. Some of the graves had offering as food as well. Tortillas, bowls of chili, bottles of soda, fruit, and whole heads of tiny donkeys, horses, and pigs made out of pastry or sugar. One grave was a beautiful little cat with a pink sugar nose and a tail curled around its feet. Matt saw people sitting in the shadows speaking to one another in quiet voices. Where are we? he murmured. A cemetery, Chicho, said Consuela. Don't tell me you've never seen one. Not like this, Matt thought. The Alacrans were buried in marble mausoleum not far from the hospital. It was the size of a house and decorated with so many angels it looked like a convention of them. You could see through the front door to what appeared to be chests of drawers on either side. The name of a departed Alacran was inscribed on each drawer. Matt guessed you could slide them out like the ones in his room where Celia packed his shirts and socks. The Idgits, of course, were buried in mass graves outside in, out in the desert. Tamlin said the resting places were impossible to distinguish from landfill. This looks like a party, Matt faltered. It is, cried Philodidio, suddenly appearing from amid a group of women who were unpacking picnic baskets. We're so lucky. Of all the days we could have come, we picked El Dio de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. It's my favorite holiday in the whole year. He munched on a sandwich. Matt couldn't understand it. Celia had celebrated every holiday in the calendar, but she had never mentioned this one. She put out shoes for the wise men to leave gifts in Christmas. She colored eggs for Easter. She served roast turkey on Thanksgiving and heart-shaped cakes on St. Valentine's Day. She had special ceremonies for San Mateo, Matt's patron saint, and her own St. Cecilia. And of course, there was El Patron's birthday party. But never, never, never had anyone dreamed of throwing a party for death. Yet there Matt saw, on grave after grave, statues of skeletons playing guitars or dancing or driving around in little plastic hover cars. Skeleton mothers took skeleton children for walks. Skeleton brides marry skeleton grooms. Skeleton dogs sniffed lampposts, and skeleton horses galloped with dead riding on their back, death riding on their backs. And now Matt became aware of an odor. The foul stench of the river was kept away by the wall, but the air was full of another scent that made every nerve in Matt's body tighten with alarm. It smelled like Felicia. It was those her ghosts had hovered before him, breathing the heavy fumes of whiskey into his face. He sat down, suddenly dizzy. Are you sick? asked Philodidio. Guapo, find another inhaler in my bag, said Consuela. No, no, I'm all right, said Matt. The smell here reminded me of something. It's only the copal incense we burn for the dead, Consuela. Maybe it reminds you of your mom, papa. But you mustn't be unhappy. Tonight is when we welcome them back, to let them see how we're doing and offer them their favorite foods. They eat? Matt looked at the tamales, bowls of chili, and loaves of bread decorated with pig sugar. Not as we do, darling. They like to smell things, said Consuela. That's why we serve so many foods with a good odor. Miabolita said they come back as doves or mice. She said I mustn't chase anything away if it wants to eat, said Philodidio. That's also true, said Consuela, putting her arm around the little boy. Matt thought about the alacrans in their mobile stump mausoleum. Perhaps El Patron was there, in the top drawer, of course. Then Matt remembered Celia saying El Patron wanted to be buried in an underground storeroom with all of his birthday presents. Was anyone putting out food for him tonight? Had Celia prepared tamales or bowls of moenda? Menudo? Menudo? But Celia was hiding in the stables, and Mr. Alacran would put so much as a single chili bean because he hated El Patron. Matt blinked away tears. How can anyone celebrate death? Because it's part of us, Consuelo said softly. Miabolute said I mustn't be afraid of skeletons because they carry my own inside, said Philodidio. She told me to feel my ribs and make friends with them. Your grandmother was very wise, said Consuelo. 
I'm off to town for the now for the fiesta," said Guapo, who had, <clears throat> "I'm off to town now for the fiesta," said Guapo, who had put on a handsome black sombrero and slung a guitar over his shoulder. "Do you think kids want me to drop you off anywhere?" Consuela sighed. "You old rogue! You only want to chase women." "I don't have to chase anyone," the man replied haughtily. "Come home in one piece, Guapito. I worry about you." She kissed him and straightened the sombrero on his head. What about the kids? Shall I take you to see Chacho? He's in the hospital at the convent of Santa Clara. What about the keepers? Matt said. They stay off the streets when there's a party. Too much fun, said Consuela. But just in case. She fished around in her large bag and brought out a pair of masks. I was saving these for my grandchildren, but I'll get them something else. She fitted a mask over Fidelidio's face. Matt felt a strange tightening in his chest when he saw the skull staring back at him from Philodidio's skinny body. Put yours on too, urged the little boy. Matt couldn't move. He couldn't take his eyes off Philodidio's face. I've got one of my own, said Guapo, slipping on his mask. That's an improvement, believe me, said Consuela. Guapo capered around his black sombrero bobbing over his skull face. Matt knew they were trying to cheer him up, but he only felt horror. Listen, mi vida, said Consuela. Matt flinched at the sound of his own name. I don't know what bad things happen to you, but it's a matter of safety to wear, ma wear the mask now. The keepers won't bother you if you're wearing a costume. Matt saw the wisdom of her suggestion. Very reluctantly, he pulled the mask over his head. It fitted him like a second skin. Uh, with holes for eyes, nose, and a mouth. He felt like being buried alive. He felt like being buried alive and had to struggle against panic. He took a deep breath and willed the horror away. Muchas gracias, he said. De nada, Consuelo replied. End of chapter 35. Whoosh, it's coming, drawn to a close. I gotta start getting ready to go real soon, so I'm probably gonna blow through one more chapter and then save the other two for tomorrow. Or later today, either or. So, I will see you all next time.